So just a few quick housekeeping pieces. If you haven't already visited our restroom, it's across this hall over here, and there is some water in the back. Um, that's about that. I just, <laughs> a lot of housekeeping around here. Yeah. So I'm Crystal Howard. Um, I work here at the Gaming Commission in our workforce diversity development. Um, we are, we, I personally was a little bit concerned about how daylight savings would impact the energy of this room. So thank you all for having your coffee this morning. I know I needed two cups because you guys have brought a lot of energy already. So I hope you're ready for our program. Um, I know there are a lot of other engagements this week, being uh, National uh, Small Business Week for Veterans, and I'm really excited you guys came here. So thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce uh, Jill Griffin, the Director of Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development, to get our program started. Thank you, thank you. Um, as Crystal said, um, I'm Jill Griffin. I direct the Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development Department. And um, on behalf of the Gaming Commission, I'd like to welcome you here today. Um, as the daughter of a U.S. Army veteran who served as an ammunition non-commissioned officer in World War II in the Pacific Campaign, and the sister of a veteran who served in active duty as a captain in the field artillery unit for the U.S. Army. Um, this is really important to me. Um, I'd like to say for the men and women here today who have served our country, thank you for your service. Our event today is aligned with a charge um, to fulfill and maximize um, the charge of the gaming law regarding economic opportunity for the men and women who have served our country. Today, you will hear about each casino's, uh, casino licensee's goals, their commitment to and interest in doing business with companies owned by veterans. Um, I'd like to actually introduce um, a champion within the commission for economic development and someone who has made a priority to ensure that we maximize opportunities for our men and women who have served our country. Um, and here to tell you more about the priorities of the gaming law um, related to veterans, um, Massachusetts Gaming Commissioner Bruce Stebbins. Oh, come on, they deserved applause too. We were a little silent. Um, good morning, or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, as Jill pointed out, um, I'm one of the four uh, members of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Uh, I had, when I took this role on, my biggest interest was looking at the economic development impacts of gaming. Uh, the bill was certainly passed with the intention of one, creating jobs for Massachusetts residents, but it was also trying to recapture revenue that we knew Massachusetts residents were spending out of state. Uh, but ancillary to all of that was the notion built in of providing business opportunities for small and medium-sized businesses across Massachusetts. And as I've quickly realized, uh, what's interesting about this purchasing piece, which is prioritized in the statute, is that employment kind of is localized. I mean, you'll only travel so far for a job. But when it comes to purchasing, when it comes to buying supplies, that supplier can be on the other end of the state. Uh, MGM, um, which we're happy to have here, is located right along the Connecticut River, but believe it or not, that's not where they thought of when they thought where we were gonna get seafood for our restaurants. So they had a great opportunity to partner with businesses in Gloucester and businesses in New Bedford to supply uh, their needs in the culinary side of the house. So um, again, I want to thank Crystal. I want to thank Jill for putting this program on together as we lead up to Veterans Day uh, and acknowledging uh, veteran small businesses. Again, if you saw the headlines today, we're reminded about the tremendous sacrifice that our veterans make. Uh, one in particular, a mayor from out west who sadly leaves behind his family while he was being deployed in Afghanistan. So this work is very important to us. Um, 
when the gaming statute came out, it talked about making sure that our licensees do business with minority women and veteran-owned businesses. Well, minority and women-owned businesses have always kind of been out there in the forefront. There are resources available. The veteran certification was something new to everybody in the Commonwealth. How do I become a veteran certified business? How, how do I know what businesses out there are owned by veterans? So we kind of took up the charge to get the word out. And we had some great partnerships uh, with the team in the back from Supplier Diversity Office and OSD or in the Commonwealth to try to come up with a solution, try to figure out how we not only draw a veteran-owned business to raise their hand and say, I'm a veteran-owned business, but how to get them certified so that they could be um, taking advantage of the opportunities available to them through the expanded gaming statute. So we're excited to have all of you here. We're looking for people to help us get the word out to veterans you might know in your own community, or if you're a veteran-owned business, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to talk to one of our licensees. We're lucky to have a number of resources that are available to veterans uh, located in the back of the room. So as you're out talking to veterans who might own a business, there are resources for uh, a streetwise MBA. There are resources for certification. There are resources with Mass Hire for finding veterans to be your employees. We have our team from GameSense, uh, which is a unique effort here in the Commonwealth to help Massachusetts residents avoid the pitfalls of addiction to gaming. And we, uh, we also know through our research that veterans are sometimes the most predisposed to fall victim to addiction, especially when it comes to gaming. So our Game Sense team has been uh, helpful in helping people get the right resources, helping to educate them about being on the exclusion list so that they have some support and not gambling. Uh, but again, veterans are as much a focus for us as it is for all of you in this room. So with that, I want to, again, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your attendance. I think you're going to hear some great information today from our licensees and from our partners at the Supplier Diversity Office. But uh, again, on behalf of the Gaming Commission, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the great job that you do. Thank you for the important job that you do. Uh, and we look forward to working with you in any capacity that we can. And with that, I will turn it back over to the real brains behind the operation of this event, Crystal Howard. We're really lucky to work with Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Um, he supports us not only in this, but all of our initiatives for women, minority, and veterans. Um, uh, I really have the great honor of introducing our first licensee who is going to give you a lot of information that you're here to actually hear, Eli Heward from Plain Ridge Park. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Crystal and Jill and Commissioner Stebbins for having me here, uh, inviting all of us and um, to, on the curtails of uh, Jill's statements. <clears throat> for all of you who have, uh, have served, thank you for your service and, and supporting our country. My name is Eli Heward. I'm the purchasing manager at Plain Ridge Park Casino. So I want to begin and kind of tell everybody a little bit about our property and myself. And uh, then we'll get into Penn National Gaming a little bit and who we are as a company. And then I would like to the opportunity after we're all done uh, here and get to know you a little bit more about what you are and what your company is all about. Players Park Casino is the uh, first operation to open in Massachusetts. Uh, we opened up in June of 2015. Um, we are a slot parlor, so we're not a full-blown uh, casino. We've got a Class B license, um, so no table games. But we do offer harness racing and uh, simulcast. Uh, harness racing is uh, live uh, April through November, so we're just getting into the last end of that. Um, if you haven't been out to uh, see a live harness race, it's very fascinating. Those horses are absolutely gorgeous animals, and uh, they do a great job. Uh, we also offer simulcast year-round, so we get to see other opportunities for uh, racing around the other properties uh, around the country, and sometimes even around the world. Uh, that can all be viewed for our simulcast opportunities. We do have uh, six food and beverage outlets. 
um, including Slacks, which is, features local seafood. It's a high-end gourmet restaurant. They have some pretty good steaks there, too. So go out, try some oysters, all from the local region, and uh, some really nice steaks. Uh, we also offer uh, a sports pub, which is open uh, seven days a week. That's Doug Flutie Sports Pub. And uh, they've got some really good burgers there, too, if you're ever interested. <clears throat> We do offer a uh, banquet space and uh, some, uh, some meeting and event space there as well. Um, located on the second floor overlooking the racetrack. This is actually the best time of the year to get out there and take a look because we're still running the horses and the foliage is absolutely gorgeous. So Playwitch Park Casino is part of Penn National Gaming. Uh, we just recently acquired uh, Pinnacle Gaming uh, about, a month and, about a month ago. Uh, and that puts us as the largest regional operator of gaming uh, in the country. So we've got 40 locations across the country. We employ over uh, 30,000 team members. Um, it is a great opportunity for us locally. Uh, we off, we've got uh, properties all the way up in Bangor, Maine, um, and then in the Northeast region all the way down to West Virginia. So part of my job is to work very, very closely with the Penn National and Pinnacle teams to find other opportunities and synergies across the entire company. So there might be some meeting today that happens that could have a global escalation throughout all of Penn National Gaming as I've got direct contact to all of the heads of procurement and all of the regional directors. Throughout our history here at Plain Ridge Park Casino, um, diversity year over year spend has been on a steady incline. Uh, we've done some pretty amazing numbers since we've opened in 2015. Uh, we did struggle in the beginning, uh, just sheer due to, um, you know, the registration opportunities and uh, trying to find the right vendor mix. Since then, we've uh, attended a lot of events like this, moving in the right direction, and hopefully today we'll be able to bring on some more opportunities for uh, Playrich Park Casino, Penn National Gaming, and yourselves as well. One of the opportunities that's coming up would be a diversity fair. It'll be happening in the early 2019. Uh, date has not yet been finalized, but we're working with our banquet staff to try and make sure that this is going to happen and we'll be able to collaborate with the uh, Gaming Commission and, and provide some information about the event at, at that, that point in time. We're partnering with the Center for Women in Business Enterprise, the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council, uh, the local area chambers, and we plan to have some networking events so we would have some customized matchmaking sessions with um, a key, key decision-making uh, uh, personnel at the property, get you in and talking to the appropriate people, people who can answer questions better than I can uh, about their specific needs. Um, there'll be some property tours and some nice giveaways. Showcase here are a couple of opportunities for us at the property. Um, but we are certainly not limited to a few of these opportunities. If there's something that you think that you can offer us, I want to hear about it. I want to be able to talk to you. I know my team, I know my property, um, and I know Penn National Gaming. So I'll be able to listen to what it is that you've got and put you in the right direction, put you in touch with the correct people to, to see if there is, in fact, an actual fit. If there is a fit, Fantastic. We would love to be able to make sure that this works. We could work very, very closely together to get you registered with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission and get you registered with uh, Penn National Gaming, Claims Park Casino as a vendor. Um, again, these are some areas of opportunity for us. We would absolutely love to talk to you, anybody in with these categories, but there are so many more opportunities out there as well. And um, uh, we just recently uh, announced a uh, hiring event um, and we're always looking for uh, folks to uh, join our team at Plain Ridge Park Casino and Penn National Gaming. So if you know of anybody in the workforce that's looking for opportunities as a, um, uh, that might be interested in working with us, uh, we're always interested in that as well. Here's some key contact information for you. So uh, if you would like to do business with us or if you have any other contacts uh, and colleagues that you would like to send some information to, um, PLR-purchasing at pngaming.com is the uh, direct line to everybody in the procurement staff at Play Rich Park Casino, including myself. Uh, we will be able to review a statement of, um, of capability, send that along to us. We'll be able to review, get it in the hands of the right people. We'll be in contact with you uh, if there's any interest. Um, 
part of the registration process with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission requires a statement of business relationship form to be completed by a gaming licensee. My contact information is right there. I'll be more than happy to supply that if there's a good fit. I'll fill out the appropriate information and send that along so you can complete your application to the Gaming Commission. I'd also like to remind everybody that the vendor registration submissions for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission be sent to 101 Federal Street right here in Boston. Um, contact information is right there. Any questions about the licensing process, uh, you can email to vendorlicensing.mgc at state.ma.us. Um, they will be more than happy to walk you through the process, as will I. I've been working with them for about four years now to complete the process. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to help out. Again, Plainridge Park Casino, we're located in Plainville, Massachusetts, right off of 495 and Route 1. We're about three and a half miles south of uh, Gillette Stadium on Route 1. Uh, if anybody has any uh, knowledge of the area, we're right off the highway. Thank you very much, everyone. I look forward to speaking with every single one of you later on this afternoon. Thanks, Eli. That was great. So I would like to bring up Ryan Geary from MGM Springfield, which, as many of you know, just opened in August. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Geary. Um, I'm the operations controller for MGM Springfield, so I oversee um, the procurement team um, on the ground here locally in Massachusetts, uh, as well as uh, our supply chain operations team, which includes our warehouse and inventory control. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes uh, today um, to give you a little update on how uh, the project's going. Um, we as you may know, opened up August 24th of this year, um, and the opening was a huge success. Um, big embracement from the community, um, great turnout. We saw over 150,000 visitors in the first weekend, um, and we've hosted 21 events uh, since we opened. So uh, give everybody a little bit of um, insight to the type of entertainment that uh, we're kind of bringing to the area. Uh, we've had Jabberwockies, Blue Man Group, uh, the Dropkick Murphys, as well as uh, many other featured local bands as part of our entertainment offerings. <clears throat> and um, as part of the plaza activation, which is our outdoor area, we've had uh, numerous other local events, such as farmer's markets. Um, we've brought in a local brewery uh, called White Lion. Uh, we do a White Lion Wednesday event through the, the summer and the, uh, the early fall. Um, <clears throat> the procurement uh, efforts of my team, which is all here today, who uh, I hope you all stop by and meet us later. We don't have a table, but we're all here. We've all got the, the name tags on to make it easy for everyone. Um, <laughs> through their efforts and the efforts of our, uh, you know, our corporation, our, our global procurement team that's also located out in Las Vegas, uh, we were able to procure uh, over, over $90 million in uh, pre-opening uh, goods, um, 37 million of which uh, were uh, biddable spend, which we consider for uh, um, diversity-owned businesses. Um, <clears throat> so um, with that, I'd like to uh, invite you all to come see our property. Um, if you've heard about it, um, it's, it's one of the uh, only properties in our portfolio that's located in a downtown urban district and um, it's fully integrated um, and when I say fully integrated I don't I don't only mean the types of food and beverage offerings and entertainment offerings um, it's fully integrated into the community so uh, what they did with this uh, with this site uh, is really something to behold um, they pulled together I believe it was 21 different parcels um, to make this site and um, they, they kept the historical uh, items of historical significance and integrated them into the property. So everywhere you look are pieces of Springfield and pieces of that history that um, we've all come to, to know and love uh, about our city. So uh, please come visit us. We'll, we'll be actually putting an ice skating rink out on the plaza 
here to celebrate the holidays pretty soon, and we'll have a tree lighting ceremony. Um, so uh, we're going to continue these types of activations uh, throughout the, the winter season. Um, just a quick look at our, our commitments to, to diversity. Uh, through our host community agreement, we have a total of 27% uh, overall goal, um, which is one of the highest uh, throughout our company. Um, and these goals, uh, we always like to mention, these goals for us are a floor, not a ceiling. Um, our, our intent is to e exceed these goals each year. Um, we're here today to talk about uh, veteran-owned businesses, uh, which means all of you. And um, we would love you know, to see that 2% uh, climb up into the, you know, closer to the, the 10 or 15%. Um, uh, but what we need in order to, to achieve that is uh, we need to identify some more veteran-owned uh, businesses. So that's why we're here today. Um, again, please make sure that you come see us. Uh, any questions you have regarding our process or our approach um, or any of the opportunities we have um, throughout our property, our team would be more than happy to, to speak with you about. Um, they're very knowledgeable, and um, they live and breathe this every day. <clears throat> Briefly, uh, I wanted to just touch on our approach. This is kind of the approach that, that we've been uh, utilizing throughout the, the development phase of the project and, and again, into the, uh, the operating phase. And, um, the question we try and answer with this, this diagram here is really, how do we achieve our goals in a way um, that are both sustainable and mutually beneficial to not only our suppliers, but our business and ultimately the community, right? And the number one way we do that is we build a foundation of uh, community partnerships. So we actually uh, were extremely lucky in that our construction and development team were able to develop some really strong relationships early on uh, during the campaign phase of the project. And uh, we were able to take advantage of those relationships moving into the operation phase of the project. So um, we you know, meet frequently and, and throughout the pre-opening and, and again through operations uh, with various group, excuse me, groups, uh, <clears throat> local chambers, um, our, our partners at the commission, uh, and our certification partners. Um, and what these allow us to do uh, is, is really establish uh, our roots in the community, uh, understand um, who's out there, what they can do for, for the business, and really strive to, to match them to uh, our operational needs. Um, and that's the other kind of cornerstone of, of this foundation that you see here. Um, and when I say matching, um, that really talks about a couple of different things. So one of the things that we like to do is right size the opportunity. So um, what I mean by that is <clears throat> I'll, I'll use a, a mattress supplier, for example. So uh, during the pre-opening phase, we had a, an opportunity to, uh, we were sourcing all the mattresses for our, our hotel. And we had a local supplier who um, we really liked, um, really had the quality we were looking for. But that supplier was only able to supply the, the mattresses for um, for our suites, so our, our elevated uh, guest experience suites. So uh, we were able to break that opportunity really into two opportunities and, and um, allow that supplier um, to take advantage of that and do business with us and hopefully eventually grow and to be able to support the volume for the rest of our rooms. Um, another thing we, we like to do is, um, you know, even though we're a large corporation and many large corporations, um, they, they'll look at their tail spend and they'll try and manage that and consolidate it into a, a smaller supply base to, to drive savings. Um, in a lot of cases, we're, we're not doing that. We're, we're diversifying our supply base. And, um, and, and in order to do so, there are instances where we're paying a markup to do business with a local diverse supplier. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and you know, obviously, we want to we want to keep it competitive, but um, you know, when when it comes right down to it, we want to we want to do as much business as possible with with all of you, with diverse and, and local suppliers. Um, this is just a brief overview of our process. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. This is 
uh, really what we what we used throughout the pre-opening phase. And so we, we looked at our budget and um, we developed a, a mechanism, if you will, to operationalize that, that information. And we, uh, we developed a matrix of uh, biddable opportunities that we then brought to these meetings uh, with our community leaders and with the, the Gaming Commission. Um, and we really leveraged our um, uh, supplier task force uh, to, to help match and help identify um, and relieve any gaps that we had in our supply base. Um, so all this kind of boils down to uh, what we talked about in the last slide, which is matching the supplier to the opportunity and really making sure that that opportunity is right sized. So uh, we're, we really want to develop long term relationships. And, and so, you know, that initial opportunity might not be, uh, you know, the entire uh, piece of business, uh, depending on uh, what supplier we're talking to. If that supplier is ready to grow, then that's great. Um, we, we would definitely uh, be open to, you know, to, to bidding that whole opportunity. But in the case that the supplier is, it, you know, still trying to get their footing, doesn't know, um, you know, if they can handle all that volume initially, we'll allow them to step into it a little bit. And and we also offer um, supplier mentorship programs, uh, not only locally but but through our corporate partners, um, that really help any new suppliers that are maybe even new to the industry um, get their feet under them, uh, make sure that they're doing the right things to to support the volume and to be able to, to grow with, with the business. Quick touch on my team, they're here, those are their faces. Uh, we have Jeffrey Lines, our procurement operations manager. He's right up here in the front. Uh, Eddie Australia, our assistant manager. Um, and Deborah Arnold, who I didn't have a picture for, sorry Deborah. Uh, she's also here, she's our purchasing coordinator. So, um, th that's the team that makes up uh, MGM Springfield Procurement, and uh, they are, what I like to tell everybody is they, they have local knowledge. They're all, uh, Eddie and Jeff, born and raised in Springfield, and uh, Debbie's from, from Massachusetts, Milford, correct, originally. Um, so they, they have local knowledge of the, the market, uh, the, the supply chain, and the, and the supply base. Uh, they have a local commitment to our, to our goals and to our suppliers and our business and they are the local support. So these are the guys that initiate the process, address any issues that come up throughout the process, whether it be um, submitting your gaming application, um, registering, um, getting your first PO, all of those things. These are the guys that, um, that reach out and, and really help to uh, make that process go smoothly. Just to touch on uh, some success here, so it's a lot of information uh, on the screen, but uh, really what, I, what I'd like to show everybody and highlight here is that all the uh, suppliers that are highlighted in yellow are diversity suppliers in the state of Massachusetts. So you can see we have quite a few. Um, this represents minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. Um, and then the pictures surrounding this uh, graphic are just examples of different types of events the team has been attending. Uh, we do site visits with suppliers. Um, we've got a, a local um, uh, lenders network uh, event highlighted there, and then some uh, volunteering that we've done. Uh, so the bottom right, we've, we, that was us doing a cleanup event of the Connecticut River. Um, and all the hard work really that we've done through the pre-opening um, kind of came out in the third quarter report uh, for internally for diversity reporting. So two of our, two of our diversity suppliers here made the top 10 um, across the company in, uh, you know, in dispersed funds uh, for diversity spend. So I think that's huge. That's a huge testament to the work that we've done to our commitment. And um, we're just all just delighted to, to see that and, uh, and share it with you all. The last thing I want to touch on is the reason we're here today. Um, we need you guys. So uh, all that success and everything, that, that long list we had on the last slide, that's, that's all great. But we are still looking uh, for more veteran-owned businesses. We want to grow this list. Um, quite frankly, you know, we need to grow this list. And um, that's why we're here. So please, again, 
um, stop by, talk to the team before we leave today. Um, and um, I want to get everyone's information and make sure that uh, and we know who you are. Some resources outside of our team here. Um, we have the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Vendor Advisory Task Force. Um, so we met uh, monthly through pre-opening and we're continuing to meet uh, post-opening. And this is, again, where those discussions are being had. We have our, our community um, leaders and our certification partners uh, present. And we're talking about upcoming opportunities, who might fit, um, who they know of, um, that could help fill, fill the gaps that we have right now. So um, that's a great resource. Uh, another one is our website. Uh, please go ahead and visit. It's mgmspringfield.com slash suppliers. Um, you can register with, uh, with us there, um, submit all your information, uh, what kind of service or product you provide, and then you'll be in our database um, so we can add you to our, any, any upcoming opportunities we have. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Thanks again, Ryan. Um, we know that both you and Eli came pretty far to be here today, so it demonstrates your commitment to this cause, and we're glad you guys will actually get to connect with them. That's pretty important. Uh, I think, yeah, all right. So um, as I accidentally skipped to the next slide, we are showing you who's coming right up next. Um, I'd like to introduce David Granada, who's hiding in the back very inconspicuously. Um, from Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, welcome, thank you for coming out. Um, just, I'm gonna give a brief overview of the property and some of the goals and objectives that we've set as a company. Uh, before I get into that, I just wanna let you know we have a table in the back you can go back there and talk to Nadia and Andrew. We've got handouts. We've got some really granular details on some of the um, opportunities that we uh, anticipate in the coming months. Um, so just a couple of pictures, and then we'll get into the numbers and the commodities, which I think is what everybody's mostly interested in. This is as of about a month ago before our tower crane came down. So we're a little bit further along. Um, for those of you that don't know, our anticipated opening is June of 2019. We're right on the shores of the Mystic River in Everett with a lovely view of the uh, natural gas tanks in uh, Everett and uh, the, um, the, Summer, the Somerville shoreline. Um, this is an era, again, these are all about a month old. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the property itself. So this is a 33-acre lot. Um, which over the centuries actually was heavily contaminated. So I think the last uh, commercial usage of it was a Monsanto plant that was there for 100 years, 75 years, um, highly contaminated. Before that, though, going back to the Revolutionary War, there were tanneries all along the, uh, the Mystic River. And I guess the chemicals that they used were highly caustic. So there were literally hundreds of years of contamination. And um, the Encore Boston Harbor team, predating me, uh, removed 480,000 tons of contaminated soil, scooped it up, railroad cars, uh, week after week, month after month, trucking it out. I don't know where it went, but it's not in Everett anymore. Um, dredging the, uh, the Mystic River and the inlet there, um, laying new sand, new gravel. Um, one of the coolest things is if you look along the shoreline, that green strip, uh, we are now in the process of planting a natural shoreline. So we're bringing the shoreline back to what it looked like a thousand years ago. Um, we're planting native plants. The birds are coming back, the fish are spawning. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff happening. And all of that time and energy was before they ever even dug the first footing. So <clears throat> the facility itself is 3 million square feet, uh, a 200,000 square foot gaming floor, which is bigger than all the gaming floors for Wynn in uh, Las Vegas combined. 
Um, it's really going to be quite a property, and like I said, we, we hope to open in June. Um, one more picture, and then we'll get into some of the commodities. Uh, this is, I believe it's, is it Red 8, Nadia? Do you know? Yeah, okay. This is um, going to be one of our Asian restaurants when it does open. Um, and it's really just, uh, I don't have a lot of pictures. I think this is the last one. But just to show how far we are in the construction project, that we've got ceilings in and marble down, and we're really, um, we're really trying to make this a, a quite a special place. Um, <clears throat> so there were three phases to the entire project. The first is the construction phase, which we're using Suffolk, which is a very, very well-renowned um, uh, um, Boston construction firm. Uh, moving into the furniture, fixtures, and equipment phase, which is where we do a lot of the load-in for, uh, for the really big stuff, the big kitchen equipment and um, a lot of the hotel furniture, stuff of that nature. Where we're now approaching is the operations phase, which is where my team comes in, and we now have the responsibility of filling this place. So it's 3 million square feet, and the total project cost is estimated at $2.5 billion. And as I keep reminding my team probably 80 times a week, uh, if we don't fill this place, then that's $2.5 billion that for an empty building. So we have a lot of stuff that we have to get um, across um, such a wide variety of commodities. Uh, again, I encourage you to visit our table back there because we really have a detailed listing of what those opportunities are. Um, <clears throat> this uh, slide right here is really just a summary of those 76 commodities that I just described. So. It just runs the gamut, uh, whether we're talking about beverages, whether we're talking about um, different food types, uh, china glass, silver, disposables, um, general ops, hotel ops. I'm not going to read the list. It's very extensive. But these are all the areas that are in play for us. And um, similar to the other gaming properties in Massachusetts, we've made some very strong commitments, not only in the um, minority women and veteran-owned business space, but also with our local communities. Uh, Everett is our host community. Uh, Malden, Medford, Boston, Chelsea, Cambridge, Somerville are our surrounding communities, and we have made commitments to all of the above to the tune of almost $100 million. So we're not only looking for businesses that are based in one of those seven towns and really anywhere in Massachusetts. Those, those are our core towns, but we're looking for Massachusetts vendors and more specifically, we're looking for MBEs, WBEs, and VBEs. Um, and again, there's a lot of money out there and a lot of categories and I, I just have to imagine that the, um, there must be a lot of overlap between some of the veteran owned businesses in the Commonwealth and what we're looking for. So we were very excited about attending this event because this is where we can kick all of those relationships off. Um, <clears throat> real quickly on the timeline, uh, again, we are not open yet, uh, but the timing for this event is great because for the last year we've been anticipating Q4-18 as when we would really start RFPing uh, large swaths of our business in earnest. And we're right in Q4, 18 right now. So timing is really good on all of this. Nobody's missed the boat on anything. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we expect to be awarding business soon thereafter. So December, January, February, March, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, uh, I really don't want to just read this stuff verbatim. Obviously, certain categories have certain criteria. Uh, we are going to have a very large um, uh, engineering team. So we're going to hire electricians and carpenters and plumbers, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's a 3 million square foot facility. We could never hire enough of them. So some of the bigger opportunities with us is in the trades simply supplementing our internal um, 
staff. So obviously some of those things have special requirements. You can't be an electrician unless you're licensed or a plumber, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at the handout that we have back there, and you can also go to our website, EncoreBostonHarbor.com, click on, uh, uh, I think it's called Vendor Opportunities. So the handout back there, if you don't get one, is also on that website. And it gives some pretty good details on which of those services we think need to be on call, which of them are 24-7, which of them require certain licenses. Um, but we're trying to get as granular as we can in the information we provide because if we don't, then um, we can't make that match. If we just say we need engineering stuff and we're going to be buying food, you know, that's not granular enough to really, um, you know, create the opportunity for somebody that maybe uh, owns a pastry business or they sell cleaning chemicals. So we felt strongly that the more details we provided to the public, um, the better chances we had of finding those partners that we're looking for. Uh, work with businesses of all sizes. Um, obviously, there, there are some scaling requirements. So there are, you know, if we need uh, supplemental landscaping services, I don't think a guy that owns a pickup truck and a lawnmower is really going to do it for a 33-acre property. Um, but having said that, what we're working very hard on is partnering smaller companies with bigger companies. And we think there's a lot of opportunities there as well. Um, so we do work with businesses of all sizes. Again, some of it is contingent upon the type of service. Um, as uh, some of the other properties have mentioned today, that there is a licensing requirement with the MGC. Um, and that is usually, not usually, it's triggered by our, intent, our statement of intent to do business. So the way that works is we identify you as a company that we want to do business with. Then we send the statement out. Then you register with MGC. So what we really don't want people doing is rushing the Massachusetts Gaming Commission saying, please register me. It starts with one of the three properties saying, we intend to do business with this firm. Um, and last but not least, certification is a really big thing. So this is a, a veteran. Um, event today, if you're not certified, um, I would encourage you to go see John in the corner back there, right? Are you the man? Okay. John will uh, explain that process to you. And what's really great about certification is it creates opportunities well beyond gaming. Um, I mean, it really does. There are so many initiatives out there for diversity and um, it's not just the gaming properties. There are federal opportunities, state opportunities, and most all of them, if you're claiming to be a veteran-owned business, is they're going to want to see a certification. But it just leads to business that might otherwise not be attainable. Um, and with that, that's it. So thank you very much for your time, and come, come visit us back here. Thank you, David. Thanks uh, for giving us an update, all of our licensees. Um, I want to take a moment and kind of jump in before we invite Bill McAvoy up, because uh, we're pleased this afternoon to have a very special guest with us. Uh, I would say he's heading into a busy week with Veterans Day next week, but uh, knowing what his calendar is and what he does across the Commonwealth, I'm not sure he has a quiet week. So. Uh, the gentleman I'm about to introduce, many of you probably already know him in the room, but he has been an incredible partner of the Gaming Commission. He has lent not only his time and support, but that of his team uh, to helping us be successful in this one niche of our work, which is supporting veterans, veterans for jobs, supporting veterans who own a business. Uh, but he is uh, certainly seen around the Commonwealth. I think he has gone to every corner of the state to recognize veterans offers support for veterans. He's a veteran himself. Uh, but uh, I know we would like to have an opportunity to bring some word of greetings from, uh, from the governor and lieutenant governor. It's a great pleasure to introduce 
our Veteran Services Secretary, Francisco Urena. Thank you very much. Well, so good afternoon to all of you all. Thank you for your commitment to veterans. And as we uh, all embark upon the, the month of Veterans Month, it is a very uh, important aspect. But this week is a very important week for you all as business, for you all as veterans seeking opportunities, for you all as a community that cares and wants to deliver that great news of opportunity uh, as we celebrate Small Veterans Business Week here in the Commonwealth and across the country. Uh, to our partners in the Gaming Commission, to our partners in the Federal VA, I see so, so many uh, folks, and just to our partners in general. You know, on behalf of our Governor Charlie Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito and our 365,000 veterans who call Massachusetts home, it, it is a true privilege to lead this Department of Veteran Services. Uh, we lead in so many things across the country and, and our delivery, our connections, our services, our local veteran service officers that you all should get to know. And if there is, uh, which there is, a, a partner, a community in every one of your gaming locations, make sure that they are partners. Uh, but when it comes to hiring veterans, is there's no better partner than our one-stop career centers. And I can't speak enough for the quality of work that they do not just for you all as gaming, for, for veterans in general who are unemployed, underemployed, and those for seeking better opportunities. Now, what we find ourselves here in Massachusetts over the last three years is that our unemployment rates are extremely low. And yes, for you all who are looking for employers, that gives you a little bit more of a challenge. And it has been trending that for the last three years, our numbers of veteran unemployment are lower than the general population. And that trend, yes, is positive, and, but that's a new trend for us here in Massachusetts and across the country. It used to, veteran unemployment used to be higher. And for the, I see a lot of heads uh, nodding because you know, you remember, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and so we are so very committed that these opportunities remain. Um, but in this new industry of gaming, in this aspect of looking for diversity, not just in veterans, but diversity in what makes the Commonwealth great, is creating the sense of trust that you all, as, as the latest and greatest industry in the Commonwealth, could come in and open your doors to anybody and everybody and make our way for a path for success for our veterans. I'm so very pleased that the set-asides that you all have set are benchmarks as a floor and not a ceiling, that we could continue to work towards uh, making realistic numbers, realistic goals. And yes, 7% of the population in Massachusetts are veterans, but not 7% of the veterans in that population are part of the workforce. Because half of our veterans of the 365,000 are Vietnam era veterans in their 60s and late and early 70s. And so if you look at that bell curve, the realistic numbers of the workforce are much lower than our 7% of population. So you all notice that level of integrity in the numbers and how we could adapt, but again, setting those percentages as a floor and not a ceiling. And so you all did them in the construction area, and now that you move into the next phase of operations, as our friends at MGM, and our friends in Plainville, and our friends uh, soon at Boston Encore are soon to, to do, is making, the, again, that opportunity, that pathway for veterans and families. Uh, during the time of construction, I did have an uh, opportunity to tour uh, several of the sites. And I had an opportunity to engage with many of the veterans uh, some of you all uh, took it a step further and issued uh, hard hats that distinguished veterans and set that sense of pride among the construction aspect of, of the gaming, uh, of building these massive facilities. Veterans are good for business. Veterans are good for community. The sense of mission accomplishment, the sense of teamwork, the sense of putting, uh, uh, finishing the work and camaraderie, and all the things that veterans learned while in the military, they will be great. And I know you know that. And I know that's why your commitment to our hiring our veterans is, continues. We must do more, not just for the veterans that live here in Massachusetts, but make Massachusetts a great destination for veterans to come move to. And that opportunity relies with you all to continue to spread the word about where to apply, how to apply, and that the opportunity is there and not keep it a best kept secret, or no pun intended, leave it up to chance, right? 
That was a joke, but I guess you, you all are too serious today, so uh, nobody rolled the dice on that one. No. So, but listen, um, to all of the veterans in the room, thank you for your service and your, your sacrifice. And we know here in Massachusetts that, yes, while your service matters, your biggest contribution to the Commonwealth is upon time once you donned that uniform off and you stepped in here as a civilian, bringing all the great skills that you learned in and out of the military and applying that. And it is our role as a Commonwealth and as agency heads and as partners to find those pathways to success, find true partnerships that lead to great opportunities, and make it a great place not only to live, to work, but to play. To the families of veterans among us, you too have sacrificed. And it is our wish that you know how much you mean to us. And as a veteran myself, I know having a family that has, uh, you know, wished for better days during the time that we were in the military and deployed, that we could have the sense of success upon returning home. And, and I think that's what we're creating here. Well, that's what the commission continues to strive to set a good playing field for all. And if we, as an agency, could be of any help, uh, please let us know. If there's great ideas, sometimes there are in the communities, the best ideas exist. Let us foster those together so that they don't uh, stay bottled up. To our great friends at op the Office of Supplier Diversity, thank you for continuing to guide us all in this path of not just diversifying the Gaming Commission and the institution of, of gaming, but the Commonwealth as a whole. When we came here in 2015, just a, a short three and a half years ago, less than $400,000 was being uh, spent on, on a handful of companies. And it was just a small tweak and common sense approach into not just giving opportunities for service disabled veterans, yes, that's important, but giving opportunities for all veterans because the numbers just weren't there. And the message was being, was being kept as a best kept secret. And that has changed, a lot has uh, come to the table uh, with the leadership, again, of so many great partners in government that are truly here to see our citizens and our commonwealth continue to move forward. Thank you. God bless you all. And again, thank you for your commitment in setting this today as a kickoff to Small Veterans Business Week. Thank you. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Secretary Urena. So as he alluded to, there are lots of opportunities. There's more opportunity coming. And to speak to the opportunity as far as certification actually goes, I'd like to welcome Bill McAvoy. Thank you, Crystal. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I want to thank all of our veterans for your service to our country, and I want to thank all of the folks that have committed to helping veteran businesses for your service to the, our veterans. Um, it is a very difficult act to follow, uh, Secretary Urena, uh, but the couple uh, former Lawrence boys, uh, we uh, <laughs> usually when we're doing the speaking circuit, I'm first, and he's, uh, he's the prime speaker, but um, he still is the prime speaker, and thank you, Secretary, for coming today. Um, he has been an amazing uh, asset and, um, and um, model for all of us, actually, uh, in, in, in establishing the veteran program that I'm about to talk about in a few minutes. And I thank you for all of your guidance and leadership throughout the years to establish our certification program, as well as our goals uh, for veterans. So thank you. Uh, in addition to veteran affairs, um, Obviously, the Mass Gaming Commission and uh, the Operational Services Division, Supply Diversity Office. We also have someone here from Mass Office of Economic Development, not if you wanted to wave. <laughs> Any other state agencies here? So as you can see, the Commonwealth takes um, uh, economic development, takes supplier diversity, take vet takes veterans' um, inclusion within our uh, purchasing uh, opportunities uh, very seriously. Um, what I'm going to talk a bit about today is, there's my PowerPoint working. I'm going to talk a little bit about our agency, the Operational Services Division, and the Supplier Diversity Office that I oversee within OSD. I also serve as general counsel there at OSD, so I wear a couple different hats. 
Um, we're talking about a certification program, some of our programs for small and diverse businesses, which include veteran businesses, uh, some Commonwealth business opportunities, as well as uh, the uh, Combi's uh, system, which is where you can find bidding opportunities. Uh, OSD is an oversight agency within uh, the, the executive department of the Commonwealth. Uh, we're a diverse organization. We actually procure goods and services uh, for state on, on statewide contracts, uh, which are, are available for any business, including veteran businesses, to take part in. In addition to anyone being able to bid on those, there are specific programs I'm going to talk about in a few minutes that are open for minority, women, veteran, and other types of businesses where they can have a subcontracting opportunity. So actually, you have two bites at the apple. You have the opportunity to be able to bid as a prime bidder. And also, I'll talk about our programs where you can be bidding as a subcontracted uh, for subcontracting opportunities. Two of the things that we're going to be focusing mostly on today, again, our supplier diversity office, our certification and uh, programs, as well as um, the combi system. <clears throat> this slide talks about our certification opportunities. We actually certify within the supplier diversity office minority and women businesses, which we've spoken about being available for many years. Um, these programs have, have been as, uh, well established. You're going to see through our funding um, the, this, the amount that the Commonwealth spends with these programs, uh, how, how much better established they are in time and, and in terms of investment. And we, you're going to see the growth that we've shown with veteran businesses over the years as well. In addition to those internally certified by the Supplier Diversity Office, we also accept certification for those categories as well as for service disabled veterans, disability and LGBT businesses. And that program was put in place for all veteran LGBT and disability businesses to be part of our supplier diversity program three years ago by Governor Baker. We also have a, a federal program that's overseen by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, and that's called the Unified Certification Program, and that's for federal highway projects that are uh, federally funded. These are our certification opportunities. You see we're focused mostly on the one, those that are in red, but minority, women, um, certifications, again, we do in-house. We also have some partners. Similar to the casinos that we've heard from today, they accept uh, Greater New England as well as uh, Center for Women and Enterprise. We have actually worked partnerships with that, those organizations as well as the City of Boston, where if you're already certified by them, why are we going to make you jump through hoops and fill out a full application to become certified by us? So we're going to have some reciprocity there with those organizations to get certified by the Supplier Diversity Office. We also have a small business purchasing program we're going to talk about in a minute. Our disability-owned business program um, and LGBT business programs that are certified by two national organizations. And why we're here today, service disabled veteran and veteran programs. The service disabled veteran, um, we accept certification by an organization called Disability Inn. It used to be known as U.S. Business Leadership Network and also by the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, otherwise known as VetBiz. And for, um, we, for veteran certification, non-disabled non veterans, we, we um, accept that vet biz certification as well. And two and a half years ago, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and Secretary Urena directed us to start certifying veterans internally. Um, we noticed that certain veterans was taking a little longer to become certified by the federal government. So we offered a more streamlined certification. It's probably only good in Massachusetts. Other states may accept it. You can check with them, and we'll certainly work out agreements with them. But we thought that they should be, that is, veterans should be able to become certified within the four to six weeks that we certify minority and women businesses and not have to wait. What we'd heard was up to nine months uh, for federal certification. <clears throat> These are some of the opportunities that are available in the Commonwealth. As you can see, 4.2. $7 billion, this was the end of fiscal year 17, was spent on goods and services. $1.4 billion of it was on statewide contracts. Certain items are on statewide contract. Those are the contracts that we issue from the Operational Services Division. $1.46 billion of that, $4.6 billion, we're talking pretty serious money here, was spent with minority, women, veteran, and Massachusetts small business. So as you can see, there's a lot of opportunity with the Commonwealth. Here's some of our, um, our, our procurement programs that we have available. We have a small business purchasing program. applies to any small procurement under $150,000 that should be awarded to a small business, which is defined as under $15 million in revenue, under 50 employees, and based in Massachusetts. 
Veteran businesses can, of, of course, apply for that program if they're based in Massachusetts. Service disabled, uh, I'm sorry, supplier diversity program applies to anything over $150,000. And that's where the prime bidder, so if someone is getting a large contract for computers, let's say, they're all supposed to include within their bid a commitment to spend money with minority, women, veteran businesses. So that's where you saw that prior page of $1.46 billion was spent with through these programs. We also have a municipal affirmative marketing construction program as well as our affirmative marketing program for state agencies. And that program actually is for the construction of state buildings or, or state funded schools throughout the Commonwealth. On the right side of the slide, you'll see our, our benchmarks. Again, the well-established programs that have been around for decades, minority program, for example, has 8% benchmark, women program, 3% benchmark, veteran, I'm sorry, 14%, veteran program, 3%, small businesses, 3.3%, disability and LGBT businesses, we haven't established benchmarks, there are new, new, new um, certifications. This is slide is a little bit more information about our affirmative market construction program. John oversees that program in addition to a few more programs. Again, John is in the back right of our room there. If folks would like to speak with him afterwards about these opportunities, he can tell you more information than I can about them. Here's where the rubber hits the road. This is the spending the Commonwealth has had over the past three years. So under the Baker administration, actually starting fiscal year seven, 16, um, fiscal year 15 was, um, uh, you'll see the uh, service disabled veteran program. I hate to contradict the secretary. He said, um, just want to clarify the number that was spent actually was less. It was only $33,000 that we had spent with veterans in our service disabled veteran program. And it was three, two and a half to three years into the program. We only had 15 certified service disabled veterans, $33,000. We're now up to over 150 certified veterans. And as you can see in fiscal year 17, that 33,000 has grown to almost 15 million. Our goal is to get that even higher. Just so you know what the 3% represents, it's about $100 million. So we have a long ways to go. But unfortunately, when the program was started by the prior administration, um, there was a benchmark that was established with the program before there was the capacity to really be able to handle the amount of business. In other words, we only were certifying one or two businesses at a time, and there was a goal of 3%, which is really unachievable. But we're, making, we're doing all we can to, um, to grow that. And with all of you folks here, some of the tools I'm going to talk about in a few minutes about how to become certified and how to do business with us. Hopefully, you'll help us grow that number and grow, grow your own revenues as well. Here's where you find bidding opportunities, combis. This is our e-procurement system. It's free. Just go on to combis.com, register your business. You can say what areas you sell products or services in. You'll get automatic email notifications about any of the opportunities that are available on Combis that are posted by state agencies or cities and towns. And you'll be able to bid for those opportunities on there as well. You'll also be listed, your business will be listed for agencies and cities and towns to be able to see if they're looking for folks to do business with. And they'll be able to see you as a veteran or as a small Massachusetts business. The Secretary of State also has a couple of bulletins they put out. You can contact their office at is the um, link there for, uh, for their information. Those are printed materials. I think they also publish them electronically. Um, and they actually will have some of the more construction related um, information uh, available um, on, on their publications. Also municipalities. There are opportunities for you folks to talk to municipalities. Talk to your local city and town. Tell them that you're a local business, you're a veteran owned business. A lot of those folks are really interested in supplier diversity programs, especially as it pertains to veterans. Some of the needs that the Commonwealth have, we have, um, currently has. We have trades contracts. You can see all the different trades here that we are trying to get veteran and minority and women businesses on. And these are everything from boiler services to painting to HVAC, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that goes into the maintenance and services related to buildings. Some of the resources that are available for veteran owned businesses, we have training for you to learn how to do business with the state our pre-certification workshop to become certified as a service disabled, um, as a service disabled veteran or as a veteran owned business. We also have combis training to learn about the system I've been talking about. Um, you're also, so you're encouraged to again, register in combis, also register for the small business purchasing program I was talking about if you qualify for that and take advantage of another tool we have on our website at mass.gov slash SDO where you can determine 
if you're, you may be eligible for other certifications. It's a self-assessment tool. You can go through and answer a few questions. It will tell you, yes, you qualify as a small business, as a veteran business, and as a women-owned business, perhaps. We're also holding SDO in the community days. We're going out into the communities, starting with um, <coughs> cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth to, um, to find out if there are needs that folks have and would like to us, us to address on the local level so you don't have to come all the way into Boston every time. And these are individual meetings we're setting up. If anyone's interested in us coming to your community, let us know and we'll do that. And one last thing we're doing is we're co-sponsoring events like this, working with the Mass Gaming Commission, which is really one of the most forward-thinking organizations in terms of supply diversity under the Commissioner and Jill and Crystal doing wonderful work like this uh, today. Um, this is, um, watch out for events like this. And this is the big month for it, obviously, uh, Veterans Month, that uh, there, there are a lot of events like this. Um, here's some information about our, uh, about our, um, from our website and our phone numbers, things like that, where you can reach our agency. I'll leave that up there for a few seconds in case folks would like to take a picture of that. Um, and lastly, just to talk a little bit about certification in terms of the requirements. There are, for you to become a veteran business or minority business, you know, women-owned business, et cetera, there are certain requirements that we have to, you have to go through. Um, we try to make those as streamlined as possible. We used to have a 32-page paper application years ago. It's down to seven pages. You can submit it electronically. It's not paper. Um, and we've, we took away a lot of the unnecessary requirements. But we ask folks to go to a pre-certification workshop to make sure that it's right for you, to make sure that you do, in fact, qualify, and to learn a little bit about some of the opportunities available for the Commonwealth. After you apply for certification, we actually conduct an investigation, and we determine, in fact, that there is, in fact, ownership by a veteran, in this example, if someone's applying for VBE certification, that you do, in fact, control the company, and that it's independent from any other company exerting any control over it. And that's the type of investigation that we conduct in order to make sure that it is, in fact, a legitimate business. And as you saw, several of the folks here rely on that certification. So it's important that we get it right. <clears throat> and it's also important for you as veteran-owned businesses that there isn't someone that's gaming the system, no pun intended, I guess, uh, <laughs> to, um, to uh, you know, try to become a veteran or woman or minority-owned business uh, when, in fact, they don't qualify for it. So that's why we take these uh, certifications uh, very seriously. Um, again, John Fitzpatrick, if you could wave, John, and I are in the back of the room there. If any folks have any additional questions uh, or need any additional information, um, I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. That's great information, Bill. Thank you. Um, as regulators, we obviously are very concerned with m making sure that our licensees have all the help that they need in order to reach their goals for veteran business as well as veteran employment. But we ourselves are a state agency, so we also use convoys to um, put out our procurements. And it's something that we have um, the ability to use, utilize you guys for as well. So uh, that concludes our speaking program, but I'd really like you guys to take the opportunity to stick around, network, meet our licensees, our speakers from today, and check out the resources that are available to you in the back of the room. So feel free to get up and stretch your legs. Thank you. Thank you.